and then suffered such a terrible asthma attack three or four days later that he had to confess and was shipped out to a hospital. The next day, the drill sergeant told Sizemore and the rest of the guys in the platoon that Anderson had died. A month later, at airborne school, Sizemore spotted this tall, skinny ghost doing KP duty, walked over and rubbed his eyes for a better look. Anderson had not only survived the asthma attack, somebody in the chain of command had admired his determination enough to let him stay in and keep his inhaler. But now, faced with the prospect of such pitched battle, Anderson was infected by the panic on the radio. Everybody was talking twice as much as usual, as if they needed to stay in touch, as if the radio was a net to prevent their free fall. Anderson didn't show it, but he was quaking. His stomach churned, and he was in a cold sweat. Do I have to go out there? Until this mission, nobody had gotten seriously hurt. The missions were a gas. When the megaphone sounded, get it on, he had always felt cool, action, just like all the other guys. Not now. The horror hit home when Sergeant Struker's three Humvee convoy had raced in, all shot up, and the docks lifted out the broken body of Private Blackburn, the ranger who had fallen from the helicopter to the street. Specialist Brad Thomas emerged from one of the Humvees with red eyes. He saw Anderson and choked out, Hell is dead. Thomas was crying, and Anderson felt himself start to cry. The fear was palpable. Anderson was glad to be someplace safe. He was ashamed of himself, but that's how he felt. He wasn't alone. Moments after they unloaded Pella and Blackburn, they got orders to go back out. A second Blackhawk, Durant's, had crashed and was in danger of being overrun. Over the radio, they learned that Casey Joyce, another of their buddies, was dead. Mace and the SEALs who had helped bring Blackburn back were already rearmed and ready. Anderson saw no hesitation whatsoever with these guys, but the younger rangers, to a man, seemed shaken. Brad Thomas couldn't believe it. He had been on the beach with Joyce and Pella when they were called for this mission. Within the ranger company, Thomas, Joyce, Pella, Nelson, and a few other guys hung together. They were a few years older and had a little more experience. Joyce and Thomas were both married. Thomas had gone to college for a few years, studying classical guitar before enlisting. They were less boisterous, and when it came to taking risks, still willing, but less eager. Thomas had seen his friend Pella killed, and had felt through the rest of that insane ride back to the base that he wasn't going to make it. When they arrived, he had felt an enormous sense of relief. He figured the mission was over. Things had gone completely to shit, and the rest of the guys would be rolling back in any minute. Emotionally for him, the fight was done. So when Struper approached and instructed the men to start rearming, they were going back out, Thomas was incredulous. How could they go back out into that? They barely escaped with their lives. The whole fucking city was trying to kill them. Struker felt his own heart sink. His vehicles were all shot up. The rear of his Humvee was splattered with Pilla's blood and brains. When the body was pulled out, it didn't even look like Pilla anymore. The top of his head was gone, and his face was grotesquely swollen and disfigured. Struker's men were freaking out. Mace, the grim Delta warrior, pulled Struker aside. Look, Sergeant, you need to clean your vehicle up. If you don't, your guys are going to get more messed up. So Struker strode over to his squad. Listen, men, you don't have to do this if you don't want to. I'll do it myself if I have to. But we have to clean this thing up right now because we're fixing to roll right back out. Everybody else, go resupply. Go get yourselves some more ammunition. Struker asked his 50-gunner, Will you help me clean up? You don't have to. Together, they set off for buckets of water. And working with sponges, they soaked up the blood and brain and scraped it from the interior. Sizemore saw all this and it made him wild with anger. I'm going out there with you guys, he said. You can't, you're hurt, said Sergeant Rolling Cash, who had been in charge of the squad that had gone on the water run. Sizemore didn't argue. 
He was wearing gym shorts and a t-shirt, and his own gear had been packed away for the flight home tomorrow. So he ran into the hangar, pulled on his pants and shirt, and grabbed any stray gear he could find. He found a flak vest that was three sizes too big for him, and a helmet that lolled around on his head like a salad bowl. He grabbed his saw and stuffed ammo in his pockets and pouches and came running back out to the convoy with his boots unlaced and his shirt unbuttoned and just climbed into Cash's Humvee. I'm going out, he told Cash. You can't go out there with that cast on your elbow. Then I'll lose it. Sizemore ran back into the hangar and found a pair of scissors. He cut straight up the inside seam of the cast and then flung it away. Then he came back and resumed his place on the vehicle. Cash just shook his head. Anderson admired Sizemore's eagerness and felt all the more ashamed of himself. He had donned his own gear as instructed, but he was mortified. He didn't know whether to feel more ashamed of his fear or his sheep-like acceptance of the orders. When it came time to climb in the vehicles, he again followed orders, amazed at his own passivity. He would go out into Mogadishu and risk his life. But it wasn't out of passion or solidarity or patriotism. It was because he didn't dare refuse. He showed none of this. Not everyone was as passive. Brad Thomas pulled Struger aside. Man, you know, I really don't want to go back out. The sergeant had been expecting this to happen and dreading it. He knew how he felt about driving back into the city. It was a nightmare. Thomas's words expressed how everyone felt. How could he force those men back out into the fight, especially the men who had just come through hell to get back to base? The sergeant knew all the men were watching to see how he'd handle it. Struker was a model ranger, strong, unassuming, obedient, tough, and strictly by the book. He was like the prize pupil in class, the officers loved him, which meant at least some of the men regarded him with a slightly jaundiced eye. Challenged like this, they expected Struker to explode. Instead, he pulled Thomas aside and spoke to him quietly, man to man. He tried to calm him, but Thomas was calm. As Struker saw it, the man had just decided he'd taken all he could take. Thomas had just been married a few months before. He had never been one of the chest beaters in the regiment. It was a perfectly rational decision. He did not want to go back out there to die. The whole city was shooting at them. How far could they get? However steep a price the man would pay for backing down like that. And for a ranger, it would be a steep price indeed. To Struker, it looked like Thomas had made up his mind. Listen, Struker said. I understand how you feel. I'm married too. Don't think of yourself as a coward. I know you're scared. I'm scared shitless. I've never been in a situation like this either, but we've got to go. It's our job. The difference between being a coward and a hero is not whether you're scared. It's what you do when you're scared. Thomas didn't seem to like the answer. He walked away. As they were about to pull out, though, Struger noticed that he climbed on board with the rest of the men. Uh -huh. I wanted to stop like two hours ago. Hey, what, what are you going to go get at Walmart? I ain't going to go. I'll just go tomorrow. Because tomorrow is my short day.